This is the story of the boy Jones, the palace intruder. In the winter of 1838, shortly after the coronation of Queen Victoria, a hideous apparition was seen roaming the halls of Buckingham Palace. An investigating porter found traces of soot in a number of rooms and passages. A likeness of the Queen had been smashed to the floor, and among the shards was a personal letter that had been opened and read. A constable, summoned to the scene, spotted the intruder hiding behind a pillar in the marble hall. Seized and dragged into the light of the kitchen, the phantom turned out to be a human, a stunted, very ugly boy who said his name was Edward. On his person were found two inkstand glasses, a wafer stamp, and a quantity of linen and female underclothes. Edward Jones, aged 14 years, had worked odd jobs in the past and was currently unemployed. A result, said his counsel, of the boy's belief that he was born in a sphere far below what he considered his rightful rank in the scale of humanity. He refused to provide any explanation for his actions, though he admitted to spending his days skulking about the palace, feasting on victuals pilfered from the kitchen. Do you mean to tell me, said the magistrate, that you have lived in the palace upwards of eleven months and been concealed when Her Majesty held a council? I do, said the boy, who had in fact only been in the palace for two or three days. Well, you hid behind a chair? No, but the tables and other furniture concealed me. Then you could hear all Her Majesty said? Oh, yes, and her ministers too. You are a sweep, are you? Oh, no, it is only my face and hands that are dirty. That's from sleeping in the chimneys. I do not know the names of any of the servants, but I know my way all over the palace and have been all over it, the Queen's apartments and all. An observer noted that the boy evidently seemed to think the whole proceeding good fun. Even the magistrate detected in the boy a certain harmless charm. The incident was dismissed and Edward was released without a charge. Thank you, sir. The press took up the story and for a time the boy Jones was a media sensation. But interest faded and the boy returned to obscurity. Until nearly three years later, Late one night, only months after the birth of the Queen's first child. The Queen's midwife, wakened by a sound in the nursery, called out, Who's there? and pulled back the sofa. This time, the boy's roaming had taken him deeper into the palace, into the throne room, where he sat on the very seat of power itself. He said... Victoria wrote in her diary. He had meant no harm, and had only come to see the Queen. We have since heard that he was in the palace once before, and was half-witted, and had merely come out of curiosity. But supposing he had come into the bedroom, how frightened I should have been! This time, the magistrates expressed alarm. The Queen herself had been in imminent danger. Doctors examined the boy, noting that his head was of a most peculiar formation, but declaring him sane. He was tried before the secretive Privy Council and sentenced to three months' hard labour as a rogue and vagabond. The Times was indignant. The general opinion is that some further punishment and confinement for three months ought to be inflicted to prevent another such unpleasant and might be dangerous intrusion into the royal palace. The boy retreated under the withering attention of the press, even rejecting an offer to star in a proposed play about his adventures. The stage is not sufficiently respectable for me, he cried. I think I can do better. Jones, is that you? 
Yes, it's me, replied the boy. Once again, the boy boasted of his exploits, sitting on the throne, fondling a coronet, and even reading books in the Grand Library. When his police captors expressed skepticism, the boy provided titles of the books and correctly described where each one could be found on the library's shelves. A journalist noted that, when pressed to explain his reasons for entering the palace, Jones affects the greatest indifference and refuses to give any answers. For the second time, the boy Jones was brought before the Privy Council, away from the prying eyes of the press. Privately, the government was beginning to panic. Prison had not quashed the boy's strange obsession. What would he do next? Would he harm the Queen? The boy emerged from his second three-month stint of hard labor to discover that he was recognized everywhere. There is the boy who went into the palace. And strange men followed him in the street. In a desperate bid to be rid of the boy, government agents abducted him. He was spirited to Liverpool and aboard the Tiber, a ship bound for Brazil. The Times soon reported that he had been taken quietly in hand by the proper authorities. Upon returning to Liverpool four months later, he was pressed into service as a second-class ship's boy aboard the frigate Warspite. With the exception of a few failed escapes, he spent most of the next seven years at sea as an unwilling sailor in Her Majesty's Royal Navy. How could it be, wondered the penny satirist, that a young man could be kidnapped by the police and pressed on board a man of war in violation of all law? But if Jones had any remaining supporters, they were quiet now. Discharged from the Navy at the age of 24, the boy discarded his military discipline, though not the uniform, and committed a series of brazen robberies that saw him committed first to the notorious Newgate prison, and then transported to the Australian penal colony. Here, he seems to have found a degree of contentment, working as an assistant pie maker. Hot pies, pies, all hot then rising to the position of town crier. Hear ye, hear ye, hear ye, hear ye. But his past had travelled with him. The local children chided him relentlessly about his boyhood adventures in the palace. Did you toast the queen? Did you see baby Vicky? Tell us about your royal adventures. When Victoria celebrated her diamond jubilee in 1887, she oversaw an empire that covered nearly a quarter of the globe. By this time, Edward Jones had been living in exile for nearly 35 years. As he sat, teetering drunkenly on the Mitchell River Bridge on Boxing Day, 1893, the boy may have entertained memories of the palace, the prison, and the open sea. Two days later, the Bairnsdale advertiser reported that the boy died after falling 12 feet to the ground, cracking his skull. Queen Victoria died a few years later in 1901.